Ah, just gonna log back on to Foxel. It's been a while since I've checked on the war, because it was my last week at work for the season. Let's see how the wardens are doing. Oh. Troops, I saw a bear here. Welcome to update 47 for Foxhole. This update might just shake up some of the stalemates we see in the early war and gives everyone a whole new perspective for Foxhole. Introducing the cinematic camera. Pressing control while zooming in with the mouse wheel or zooming out will now change your camera's perspective giving you a pseudo third-person view of the battlefield. It's not meant for combat, as right-clicking will cause you to zoom back out to the regular camera mode. However, any actions that only require the left mouse button, such as hammering scrap, picking up teammates as a medic, or fixing bayonet, can still be done from this new cinematic camera. And of course, combine that with the F8 key to remove your HUD, and you can see exactly where the community is going to go with this one. I cannot wait to start recording stuff like this. And from this new camera perspective, you'll be able to get a much more detailed look at the new trenches and bunker husk improvements. Destroyed trenches and bunkers are no longer rendered as irrelevant flat planes on the battlefield. Instead, you will actually feel crumbled and uneven there's undulating terrain, and you can still use them for partial cover, although clearly not as much as when they were fully built. It also changes the visual aspect of broken down trenches, so there's not nearly as much repetitiveness on the battlefield. Damaged trenches can also now be filled in using the shovel without needing to repair first. The last change to trenches is sandbag and barbed wire upgrades can now be built using only exactly that sandbags, and barbed wire. You can't build these upgrades using BMATs anymore. This definitely helps with the consistency. If it's sandbags, you use sandbags. If it's barbed wire, you use barbed wire. Though I do also understand that this might cause some friction with logistics. We'll have to see how it pans out on the battlefield. Binoculars have seen a bit of a regression back to the old binocular system. Now, when you're not looking through the binoculars, your camera will snap back fairly quickly to your soldier. It's not exactly the same as it used to be, but it's much faster than it has been for the past few updates. Next up is a new resource. Yes, another one. However, not quite. Copper is essentially a late game replacement for iron. What I mean by that is, at the start of the tech tree, all vehicles will still function by making prototypes based off of iron. When the harvester is unlocked, Copper will start spawning at resource fields. You can pick them up and mine it with hammers or a harvester. And copper has the same basic mechanics as iron and aluminum. However, it's used to research end-tier vehicles. Everything before the harvester is unlocked in the tech tree for vehicles relies on iron. And everything in the late tech tree after harvesters relies on copper. The reason this has been implemented is to encourage people to spend the iron to get the prototypes in the early game rather than saving it up and hoarding it for the late game. In my rough estimates, this should hopefully move the mid game and late game up earlier in the progression of a war instead of having it be delayed due to hoarding issues. The devs do note that the overall tech rates have also been balanced to accommodate for the addition of copper. Speaking of prototypes, there's several new changes. Prototype vehicles now only cost 100 basic materials to manufacture with the addition of a prototype kit. Prototype vehicles are now made in the garage and shipyards. Prototype vehicles have a higher chance of being penetrated by anti-armor implements. This should balance out given that they're cheaper. But also, prototype vehicles can now be repaired unlike before where they couldn't. However, you should note that prototype vehicle repairing costs twice as much as regular vehicles of the same type. So treat them as an earlier glass cannon. 
Speaking of vehicles, the Colonials come in with an armored car in the form of the T-8 Gemini. He's got twin RPG launchers for quickly dispatching soft stationary targets. And it's not half bad against vehicles either, though definitely an anti-structure implement. However, it has no other armaments, so it's definitely going to need some escort. The Wardens counter with the O'Brien V113 Gravekeeper. And the Wardens have already given this armored car a nickname, and the nickname is... No, I'm not reading that. Come on, Bear, say the name. No, I'm not doing it. No, Bear, come on, you have to. It's a requirement. Ugh, fine. The new nickname the Wardens have given this armored car, since it has a bone saw, is the Bone Wagon. It's also an armored car, but it comes with an embedded bone saw launcher, making it a powerful anti-tank implement. Though, keep in mind, armored cars don't come with that much storage space, so these things will definitely be used in short bursts. As for weapons, well, the Wardens finally get their own faction-specific pistol, in the form of the Ati Model 2. Its functions and features are identical to the Colonial Pharaoh pistol, so just visual. The tripods have seen a bit of a rework, in a sense. First up, Colonials finally adopt their own anti-tank rifle, in the form of the mounted anti-tank rifle known as the Typhon RA-7. It has 10 rounds per magazine, and doesn't have to be cocked every time it fires. The Wardens also have a new mounted RPG tube, in the form of the Cutler Foebreaker. It's actually a twin-barreled RPG tube, so it can fire two RPGs relatively quickly. That being said, watch your ammo count. You're going to blow through it really fast with this thing. Of course, you can also single load it if you prefer. The Wardens come out with the Malone Ratcheter Mark I. This is a mounted machine gun. It's belt fed with 175 rounds of 12.7. A proper crew can defend a whole trench line with one of these babies. But not to be outdone, the Colonials come back with a Lamentum MM4. Also a mounted machine gun, but this one comes with 250 rounds per belt of 12.7. It takes a while to go through this ammunition. The tripod now actually contains a storage unit, so you don't have to carry ammunition or rounds on you as a soldier, you can instead store them in the tripod. This also helps for setting up as crews. That way, both soldiers can dump their ammunition into the tripod instead of having a trade between themselves. Another change is that pressing E on a tripod will no longer dismantle it, instead there's a dedicated action button within the tripod inventory menu. However, that's not the biggest change with tripods. No, no, no. The new weapons, they're just the start. Now, enter the half-tracks. Both the Colonial Javelin and the Hoplite, as well as the Warden Niska half-track variants, now have universal half-track mounting points. Essentially, the weapon on the vehicle has been eliminated and replaced with a tripod. So, any tripod-mounted weapons can be fitted to half-tracks, and interchanged on the fly on the battlefield. You want a javelin with the captured twin-barrel Warden Cutler Foebreaker? Go for it. How about a Niska half-track with the new Colonial Typhon mounted anti-tank rifle? Go right ahead. Mix and match to your heart's content. Additionally, the half-tracks now also come with four infantry seats in the back, so this really is an all-around variable vehicle. And lastly for the big changes, we've got field bridges. That's right. Tired of all those bridge stalemates? Wanting to cross bodies of water? How about high chasms? Like in the Deadlands? Well, now you can. Field bridges are an extendable platform of metal that can be built over and onto the water and off of cliffs. Their main battlefield role is to cross difficult terrain and give infantry and light vehicles better flexibility. In order to build field bridges, you'll need metal beams. Set them down across suitable terrain, build them, 
and send infantry and vehicles across. Also note that you can't block water routes with these things, as ships like the barge will just plow straight through them. However, not every vehicle is capable of crossing. Lighter vehicles like LUVs, trucks, and even pushable field guns are perfectly suited for this. However, heavier vehicles like tanks, half-tracks are way too heavy and will crush these bridges under their weight. However, this does leave a bit more flexibility for the armored car, which is the only armored vehicle that can cross these bridges. So ideally, you place this bridge across a river where a bridge battle is ensuing send a bunch of armored cars and infantry over, and outflank the positions guarding the bridge. That's the ideal case use. Even the lighter vehicles will damage these bridges over time, so it's best to push them across the bridge as fast as possible. Just remember, these bridges are valuable, and Logi doesn't exactly like transporting all those metal beams to the front, so don't waste bridges on crazy art placements. Some other gameplay changes include, there's now a new option in player context menus or in the F1 menu. You can now view a player's activity log. These display things such as enemy and friendly player damage, total construction, repair total, healing total, revive totals, and a bunch of other useful information. Fire pits can now be constructed on bridges. Shipping containers and resource containers can be stacked once again. Expected structural integrity is shown when browsing for upgrades for bunker or additional bunker pieces being added to existing bunker islands. Stockpiling the seaports or storage depots in towns that are not logistical hubs will create a stockpile notification allowing for commands to be provided. Craters will appear more frequently and with more organic, less checkboardy distribution. But on the flip side of that, craters can now be filled in with shovels. It will take some time to fill them in, but you can do it. All vehicles can now open gates from the driver's seat, so you never have to hop out of the driver's seat ever again. Some game balances include 30mm, 40mm, 68mm, and RPG ammo explosive radius has been reduced to mitigate infantry sniping. Thank goodness. I'm so sick of getting sniped out by weapons that shouldn't snipe me out. If I'm going to get sniped out by one of these things, it better be a direct hit. The town base industry upgrade time required to unlock has been significantly increased, but on the flip side, the town base occupied town upgrade time has been significantly decreased. The fortification upgrade time for towns has also been significantly decreased. For your bunker builders out there, the rifle garrison and machine gun garrison upgrades have been combined into a single upgrade. For artillery, gunboat artillery accuracy has been increased, mortar accuracy has been decreased, and mortar damage has also been decreased. Storm cannon and intelligence centers have had their concrete settling time increased to two days, and storm cannon and intelligence centers are always visible on the map to both factions, with a new unique icon structure for both. This is a bit of a controversial change, but we'll see how it plays out in the field. The storm cannon damage type has changed from demolition to high explosive, and damage dealt per shot has been increased in order to compensate. Construction vehicles can no longer operate from a barge deck. I didn't even know that was possible, but all right. The Niska Mark II Blinder, front ballistic shield collision, has been improved to protect the gunner. Garrison houses will now fire upon enemy build sites. Seaport vehicle capacity increased to 1,000 in the public stockpile. Seaport vehicle crate capacity increased to 100 in the public stockpile. To accompany the new field bridges, some rocks along riverbanks have been shifted around or removed outright to facilitate their use. The topography around the Great March has been updated to allow for bunker-based construction, and the main road has now been realigned to run right into the heartlands. There's also been more resource mines added in across all regions. Some other changes include factory economy production times and resource respawn times now scale with the world's population. Soldier stencils no longer show for players inside of vehicles. 
the barbed wire player walking animation has been updated. Wreckage now sorts directly into basic and refined materials. Profanity filter is now a toggle option in the chat window settings. Submit to stockpile action can now be performed on reservable crates. The observation bunker flag made visible when inside of the bunker. New upgrade icons for machine gun garrisons, engine rooms, and ladder upgrades. Items will now auto stack instead of being dropped on the ground when you're changing to a uniform that accommodates the items in your inventory. Structure suppression flag flickering contrast increased, making suppression of enemy structures easier to observe. Structure damage can now be observed on concrete trench roofs. Players reported too many times for intelligence leaks will be restricted to secure map mode. I'm sure that won't cause any friction whatsoever. Secure map mode will no longer show enemy structures flashing from listening kits and intelligence centers. Build site AI range preview will turn red when the build site is ineligible. And there's a slew of new in-game player report tools. Full text player reports can now be submitted from the F1 player list. Enemy players encountered during gameplay can also be reported via the support button in the escape menu. And users may receive an in-game response to reports submitted in this manner. This feature is still a work in progress, so more will come over time. There were some bug fixes with this update, but I'll save that for the patch notes down below. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you saw in this update, like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest Foxhole updates. And as always, good luck, keep your heads down, and stay in your Foxholes. Fair out. <laughs>